good evening, everybody, and welcome to the fifth of these lectures on the emotional history of atheism and of unbelief in the Western tradition. In the last lecture, we saw that while the religious establishments of the 16th and 17th centuries were panicking about the mostly imaginary atheism of amoral Machiavellian libertines, a quite different form of unbelief was actually bubbling up under their noses. An unbelief of anxiety, assaulting earnest Christians or those who wanted to be earnest Christians from within. It may not have been what either they or we expected to find when they thought about unbelief, but it makes a certain amount of sense. This was a period when nobody was going to drift into atheism by mistake. All the forces of social convention pushed the other way. People who had no interest in religion might find themselves neglecting it, but they wouldn't take a stand against it. They might be bad Christians, but they would hardly rise to being anti-Christian. Only those who cared enough to believe also cared enough to doubt. Most of the people whom we met in the last lecture who suffered from this kind of doubt classed it, you'll remember, as a temptation. They tried to overcome it. They tried to return as best they could to their form of faith. But in religion, as indeed in everything else, you can never really go back. And if doubt was a temptation, that meant that it couldn't simply be ignored. Any Christian preacher will tell you that the devil can only tempt you if God permits him to do so. And if God allows it, then he does it for a reason. So temptation, even the temptation to doubt whether there is a God, isn't just a meaningless attack to be repulsed. It's a trial by combat. It's a training arena. And if you, if you come out victorious, then you come out stronger. So it's to be feared but it's also when it comes an opportunity to be grasped. Last time we began with this much quoted biblical verse, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Which of course implies that faith and doubt aren't alternatives, they're companions, they're inevitably intertwined. If your faith isn't troubled by doubt, then on this reading, what you have isn't faith at all. It's vanity and smug self-satisfaction. If you don't feel vertigo when you look down, all that shows is that you're still at the bottom of the pit. This was an observed fact. It's a widely acknowledged truism that the more earnest and more intense your faith was, the more likely you were to be troubled by doubt. There's plenty of testimony for this. But it was also a theological axiom. It works in theory as well as in practice. As Elizabethan England's greatest theologian, William Perkins, put it, true faith, being imperfect, is always accompanied by doubting. And so it must be for everything in the human realm. This isn't exactly a good thing, but the preachers are clear that God permits this for a reason. As one shrewd minister reassured his readers, nothing is so certain as that which is certain after doubt. Shaking settles and roots. Doubt, on this view, is an ordeal that tempers and purifies those who pass through it. And so you shouldn't flee from it. Instead, you should set your feet, spit on your hands and grapple with it, like Jacob wrestling with God in the book of Genesis, a much depicted scene in 17th century artwork. What I want to do with you this evening is to look at some of those wrestling matches and at some of their consequences. Matches in which the combatants fought on with grim determination, found themselves forced into painful contortions and also discovered reserves of strength that they hadn't known they had. And many of them managed, like Jacob in the story, to fight their enemy to a standstill, but also like him, they sometimes sustained wounds in the process and found that the encounter changed them. This is a story 
which takes us back to the early days of the Reformation, when alongside the relatively well-ordered, carefully controlled reforms that Martin Luther and John Calvin and the other big name Protestant theologians were putting in place, there was also a wilder fringe. The people whom Luther called fanatics, whom historians nowadays lump together rather unhelpfully as the radical reformation. This group are actually extremely varied. They contained apocalyptic revolutionaries, utopian communitarians, and all points in between. But I want to draw your attention to one strand of this radicalism, those who called themselves spiritualists, a word that's confusingly nowadays refer, used to refer to those who hold seances to speak to the dead. I'm not talking about spiritualists in that sense. The two leading figures here are a pair of German preachers, Sebastian Frank and Caspar Schwenkfeld. They disagreed on a lot. We, we don't know for sure that the two of them ever actually met. They certainly seem to have reached their views independently of each other, um, which I think makes them the more interesting. Both of these men started out as defenders of Martin Luther's Reformation, but they quickly came to believe that Luther's purge of superstition and corruption didn't go far enough. Luther was very critical of outward piety. He said that that's just an invitation to hypocrisy. But he continued to insist that churches and liturgies and sacraments and all other sorts of Christian practices ought to continue, making, as it, it seemed to Frank in particular, only superficial changes to these. Frank and Schwenkfeld came to believe that true religion should be a matter of the heart and only of the heart. In Frank's case, what pushed him over the edge was the cacophony of different sects and preachers competing for attention in those chaotic early days of the Reformation. How do you know which one is the true Church of Christ? That's the sort of crisis of doubt that lots of people had in the Reformation period. But Frank arrived at a disconcerting solution. Most people just ended up picking one group or occasionally starting one of their own. But Frank decided that there was in fact no longer any true church at all. It had once existed, to be sure, but it had disappeared centuries ago when the last of Christ's original apostles had died. And so he said that the outward church of Christ went up into heaven and lies concealed in the spirit and in truth. For 1400 years now, there has existed no gathered church, nor any sacrament. Instead, he suggested the church today is a purely spiritual thing. In which case, all outward things and ceremonies have to be done away with and are not to be reinstituted. Nothing has been taken away from the child except its doll with which it's played long enough. It's time for Christians to grow up. The implications of this are dramatic. All religious observance ought to stop. No baptisms, no sacraments, no ministers, no preachers, no churches, no services. Frank didn't even encourage his readers to meet informally to support and encourage each other. He did remain convinced that the Bible is God's word, but he was increasingly reluctant to lean on its precise text. He talked about it as the rind of scripture, the covering of letters. He thought that the inner spirit was what truly mattered. And that meant abandoning not just each particular Christian church, but the notion of Christianity as a whole. The Christian creeds he disparaged as stale formulas. What mattered was the inner journey to perfection, a journey on which he insisted pagans and Muslims could join just as well as Christians could, because after all, everybody is inwardly instructed by God. So let's be plain, this isn't atheism, but it could hardly have been more hostile to religion. For Schwenkfeld, doubt and uncertainty are even more central. For him, the crisis comes in 1526 when he decides that he can't be sure which is the correct way to celebrate the Eucharist, the Holy Communion. 
and he decides that it's better to stop it altogether than to risk blasphemy by getting it wrong. He always talks about this Stillstand, as he called it, as a temporary suspension. But it's one of those temporary suspensions that has no obvious means of bringing it to an end. And pretty soon he extended this suspension to baptism as well on the same basis. Unlike Frank, Schwenkfeld does at least encourage his disciples to meet secretly for discussion and mutual encouragement. But these are communities that celebrate no sacraments, recognize no ministers, enforce no orthodoxy, nor practice anything that their contemporaries would recognize as religion. Historians of spiritualism actively debate to what extent the later generations of spiritualists were directly or indirectly inspired by these founders. Um, and that's interesting, but I actually don't think it makes a great deal of difference. What matters is that whether it's by direct influence or by independent and parallel development, these sorts of ideas kept surfacing and resurfacing. In particular, they did so in the Netherlands. I want you to notice here a Dutch group called the Collegians, who emerged in the 1620s as a set of freewheeling religious discussion groups who rejected having any fixed ministries or sharply defined orthodoxies. By the 1640s, they had a presence in most Dutch cities. In that decade, the movement's given a new lease of life by the philosopher, linguistic scholar, and religious adventurer, Adam Boreel. Um, in his manifesto written in 1645, Boreel argued that when Christ's first apostles preached, the truth of their message was undeniable because it was authorized by miracles and by the inward work of the Holy Spirit. But now, Boreal insisted, we have no such evident divine authorization. Nothing, no plain witness of God, proves the message of any church to be true. And therefore, no church can ever be sure that it is truly preaching in accordance with God's will. In which case, he said, any entity that still has the brass neck to claim that it is a true Christian church, despite lacking that certainty, is built on lies. Such institutions, he says, are malignant societies, whereinto the soul of a man fearing God ought not to enter. But he's extremely vague about what these scrupulous objectors should do instead. Certainly the collegians whom he led feel more like moral and philosophical discussion groups than like anything we'd recognize as a church. Quite how this sort of spiritualism first reached England is unclear. It's in the 1590s that we hear about English radicals allegedly, allegedly arguing that Roman Catholic baptism is invalid. That might sound like a, a niggling point or a normal thing for a Protestant to say, but it's not. If Catholic baptism is not true Christian baptism, then none of the first generation of Protestant reformers had been baptized at all. And since everyone accepted that nobody can baptize somebody else unless they themselves have been baptized, then this is something that no mere reformation can put right. On this view, the chain has been broken. The true church of Christ has vanished from the world. The same idea surfaces more explicitly with a man named Bartholomew Leggett, who has the distinction of being the second last person to be executed for heresy in England in 1612. Uh, we don't have any contemporaneous images of him. Um, this is a later Quaker postcard celebrating him, um, although he wasn't a Quaker, um, and he wasn't, as this says, an Anabaptist, um, and he wasn't burnt in 1611, but in 1612. Um, <laughs> But apart from that, I'm sure it's accurate. Um, <laughs> Leggett, like Schwenkfeld, held that all sacraments and Christian ministry should be suspended unless or until God directly intervenes to renew it. He thought that the church had been fatally corrupted by centuries of enslavement to the papacy and it could only be refounded by God's direct initiative. New baptism, he said, there cannot be till there come new apostles. New apostles there can't be who are not endowed from above 
with miracles. Now, if you had to guess the next line, you would assume that he was going to proclaim his own sect's miracles, or indeed anoint himself as a new apostle. But he says something altogether more surprising. There are no miracles. Yes, some people claim to have visions, but they're only idle dreams. And so he says there is consequently no true baptism in the earth, nor any one true visible Christian, not even himself. Our source tells us that the people to whom he said this were nonplussed by it. One asked to pray with him, and he refused. He said to do so would, uh, should imply that you and I were in communion or Christian fellowship. But before that miraculous ministry shall come, there can be no such fellowship and therefore no such prayer. Another asked if he could join Leggett's church, only to be told, how sillily you speak. I have all this while taught you that there is no church. So again, he's not an atheist, but if he has found religious reasons to abandon religious practice of any kind, well, what's the difference? And it's not just about outward show either. Even if such spiritualists really did expect that at some point new apostles would appear, a god who allows his church to dissolve into utter depravity and leaves his people with nothing at all for centuries on end is pretty ineffectual. Praying to him hardly seems worthwhile. According to one report, Leggett didn't pray to Christ for seven years before his death. He appears to have believed that God exists, but is almost entirely absent from the world. That there's no immediate prospect of that changing, and that humanity has no choice under these circumstances but to simply carry on. We don't really know whether the mood of this stark vision was bleak or whether it was liberated. But while it wasn't atheism in the strict modern sense of the word, we can see why contemporaries might have called it that. Now, again, we do not know whether this movement died with him when he was executed in 1612. What we have in his successors are echoes rather than definite lines of descent. But it's certainly true that some of the ideas which surfaced in London in the 1620s and 30s sound oddly familiar. For example, an informant who gave a detailed report on clandestine radical groups in 1638 before the Archbishop of Canterbury's court um, said that one sect, whom he called the Familists of the Mount, altogether denied prayer, the resurrection of the body, or any heaven or hell but what's in this life. Heaven, they say, is when they do laugh and are merry, and hell when they're in sorrow and pain. And at last they do believe that all things do come by nature. It's almost becoming normal for spiritualists to feel that ordinary Christian prayer, you know, actually asking God for things, or orthodox doctrines about life after death are simply too gross, too carnal for the elevated purity of their vision. The wrestlers with doubt, whom I was talking about last time, were doggedly resisting temptations to question the Bible, to doubt immortality, to deny God. These spiritualists are embracing those same questions and doubts. And they believed that by doing this, they weren't rejecting God's truth. They were pursuing it and leaving behind the crass carnalities of a childish faith. So for, for them, this is not unbelief. This is belief raised to a new height. And if reaching that height meant abandoning doctrines and practices which had been touchstones of Christian orthodoxy for centuries, well, then their boldness in doing that only demonstrates the depth of their faith and their commitment. And if the unenlightened worldlings around them call them atheists for it, well, so what? Since the time of Christ, people like such people have always persecuted the truth. Even so, we are still talking about a fringe phenomenon, a few eccentrics and, and groups of misfits around the edges of societies. 
in England as much as everywhere else, until the summer of 1640, when the authority of King Charles I's government collapsed, setting in motion the process that would lead to civil war, to the king's execution, and to 11, for 11 years to an English republic. At no point during the 1640s and 50s did England have a government with both the power and the will to impose religious conformity on the population. And the result was an exuberant flowering of religious variety without precedent in, in the Reformation era and really in, in, in European Christian history. Old radicals were joined by new adventurers at the edges of orthodoxy. And they found themselves converging on ideas and practices that look very much like unbelief and doing so on a scale that had never been seen before. Most of the zealous reformers whom the burgeoning revolution brought to power wanted to replace the Church of England's establishment with a new church and with new ministers. But plenty of radicals thought that this was a trick. Essentially the same old clerical lies and tyranny in new clothes. As John Milton famously put it, new presbyter is but old priest writ large. The logical conclusion of that was to reject the whole idea of a distinct ministerial caste altogether. Violent denunciations of ministers became almost routine. For example, a troop of parliamentary soldiers um, quartered in Warwickshire in the mid-1540s were constant, we're told, in condemning the ministers of the region, good Presbyterians as they were, dissuading the people from going to church and claiming that they themselves, the soldiers, could preach better. Bookstalls heaved with denunciations of the rituals practiced in vile stone churches and of the atheists and godless persons who still enslaved themselves to them. So th those who remain in the churches are being called atheists because they're adhering simply to the outward form of faith, while those who withdraw themselves from religion are claiming to be the ones who are practicing true faith. But attacking atheism by withdrawing from any kind of collective religious observance is, to say the least, a high-risk gambit. Or again, most of these radicals fa favored some measure of religious toleration, very much as an act of principle. But the horrified traditionalists who said that toleration was a slippery slope to atheism had a point. Toleration meant abandoning the long-cherished idea that religious unity was a glue necessary to hold society together because a tolerant society must, of necessity, be a plural one. And so it must really be one where public life, it, to some extent, is neutral, even secular. And if that sounded a bit too theoretical, the inescapable fact was that toleration eroded religion in practice as well as in theory. In a free market of religious ideas, after all, customers get what they want. Books and sects denying the most basic Christian doctrines and practices started to appear. So toleration began as a religious principle, but it was also deliberately kicking away the props that had long kept most people's religion secure. We saw last time that those who were tempted to unbelief tended to be troubled by two doctrines in particular, the immortality of the soul and the authority of the Bible. And in the 1640s, English radicals deliberately assaulted both of those doctrines. In a notorious 1644 pamphlet called Man's Mortality, the radical the future leveler Richard, o Richard Overton branded immortality a hell-hatched doctrine invented by the clergy in order to terrorize the simple into obedience. He argued that the soul isn't a Christian concept at all, but imported from pagan philosophy. He ridiculed the idea of disembodied survival as a nonsense. 
Actually, beneath the surface shock, Overton's doctrine is very close to traditional Christianity. He believes very much in a bodily resurrection of the Day of Judgment. But not everybody who followed on from him in denying the separate existence of the soul was so measured. The claim that the soul of man is mortal as the soul of a beast and dies with the body is one that surfaces repeatedly during the years that follow, sometimes with the promise of a future resurrection, sometimes not. There are others who suggested that only the soul will be raised and not the body. And that turns resurrection into something inward and spiritual. Heaven and hell, as we saw with one of those radical groups earlier, become metaphors for happiness or misery. People who took this line believed that they weren't abandoning traditional Christianity, but instead they were revealing the profound inner truths that had always lain hidden within it. If you pressed these people on what actually happens after death, a, a subject which they claimed rather implausibly not to be very interested in, um, they might maintain that every creature is God and shall return into God again and be swallowed up in him as a drop is in the ocean. Which, again, may not be atheism as such, but it ain't Christianity either. The literal authority of the Bible doesn't do any better. One radical who was confronted with awkward proof texts simply replied, this is scripture to you, but not to me. You know, how can you answer that? The radicals picked up on long-standing niggles about textual variations, problems of translation, apparent minor contradictions. You know, these are problems which biblical scholars had known about and had been successfully containing for centuries. And they turned them into real arguments against the Bible for the first time, not because they're newly persuaded by these old chestnuts, but because, unlike their predecessors, they need arguments against the Bible. And so, of course, they find them. They don't exactly reject it, but they feel that they've outgrown it. It's a tool of self-serving priests that they use to keep their people in play. A group of soldiers in Surrey, the ones who, who I quoted earlier as mocking churches and ministers in 1649, also declared that the Bible is abolished. One of, one of this group pulled out a Bible in the pulpit, showed it to the people, said, here is a book that you have in great veneration. It is abolished. It containeth beggarly rudiments, milk for babes. Again, that sense of the distinction between an infant faith and an adult one. But now Christ is in glory among us and imparts a fuller measure of his spirit to his saints than this can afford. And therefore I'm commanded to burn it before your faces. And so he set fire to the leaves of it. Some radicals distinguished between scripture as history, the dead outward letter recording what God had done in ages past, and scripture as mystery, the inner word written on the hearts of God's people here and now. So this isn't atheist scoffing. This is pursuit of a high mystery. But the effect, setting fire to Bibles, lending credence to every burgeoning doubt about them, is the same. Once you've begun cracking open the husks of traditional doctrines in order to reveal the inner spiritual riches, how do you know when to stop? Christianity is a historical faith. It's centered around a specific set of events in Judea in the first century. Is that story just a symbol as well? Gerard Wynne Stanley, who's famous as the leader of the utopian commune known as the Diggers in Surrey in 1649-50, wrote that Jesus Christ at a distance from thee will never save thee. A Christ within is thy saviour. Christ here has become the name for a universal spiritual principle, not the distant historical figure of the preacher from Nazareth. Some said that they believed in Jesus in the same way they believed in Queen Elizabeth I, because chronicles make mention of her. All the better to put their own revelations on a higher plane. Could this journey into a more rarefied and allegorized spiritualism end in actual atheism in our sense of the word? Well, it comes close. 
Jared Wynn Stanley denied being an atheist, but he also did his best to avoid using the word God. He preferred to talk of reason with a capital R instead. We do have reports of radicals claiming that there is no God, or if there be a God, the devil is a God. It does rather look as if having pursued truth all the way up the mountain, in the end, some radicals found the summit bare. Of course, most English men and women are horrified by all of this, but not all of them panicked. In 1646, this man, Samuel Bolton, prominent London preacher, master of a Cambridge college, um, published a guide to surviving in an age of abounding errors. He suggested that the burgeoning sectarian chaos was a test from God, a means for those who'd spend their lives blithely assuming that they were Christians to discover whether it was true. And he cited Jesus's parable of the house that's built on sand, who, the, whose weaknesses are only revealed when the storm comes. England, he says, is now living through just such a storm. When a man sees abundance of opinions abroad, he said, one saith this, another that, sure, it will make a man to put the question to himself. Upon what foundation do I stand? What's my bottom? And how can he have any rest until he's got, until he've gotten a better foundation to build on, a foundation which none of these opinions can shake and unsettle? There would be casualties, he said to this process. Many fair buildings are not able to stand out the blast of trial and temptations because they are houses built on the sands. The vain, the hypocritical Christian, whose faith has never had a secure foundation, will find that the multitude of opinions doth draw him away, or else atheist him, that he will be nothing. Such people will be revealed for the unbelievers that they have always truly been. But for the true believer, the sectarian cacophony, he said, has the opposite effect. It will make such a man to inquire after the rock and endeavor to build there. The multitude of opinions doth unatheist him. Put him upon the search and examination. What is the truth of God? These things do fire him out of his formality. You know, you, you moved out of a, a, a merely um, formal and conventional religion and he can have no rest until he come to some bottom to stand on. So Christians shouldn't respond to this storm of confusion by hunkering down inside their inherited orthodoxies. Instead, they should let the storm do its God-appointed work of washing away ill-founded notions and habits. And that means that if cracks start to appear in your temple, you shouldn't patch it up. You should abandon it you should even tear it down. And before you think about rebuilding, your chief duty is to dig, to work down through as many layers of shifting sand as you have to until your shovels finally ring on bedrock. Bolton hoped to use this storm, this epoch of confusion, to turn lazy, habitual Christians into earnest, engaged, but still orthodox Christians. But not everyone stuck to the script. Instead, on a scale never before seen, bands of earnest excavators began churning up the landscape of traditional religion. Many of them found their rocks and started to build again, but soon others, or indeed they themselves, began to worry that this foundation too might be shakier than it seemed. And in the process, the traditional ritual, devotional, even intellectual structures of the faith were systematically undermined or even deliberately demolished. This was an age which loved categories and labels, and so it gave a label to these people. It called them seekers. The name is a little bit misleading. It refers not to a sect, but to a mood in which sort of pretty standard Puritan dislike of ritual and superstition had turned into a hypersensitive allergy, such that it was hard for any religious practice to be pure enough. Psalm singing, collective prayers, sermons, 
how could you be sure that these things are really God's will? And if they're not, then surely it's better to be safe than sorry. Again, the most momentous issue was baptism. Plenty of these radicals concluded that baptism should be restricted to believing adults, not administered indiscriminately to babies. In 1644, a group of parliamentary soldiers in Huntingdonshire heard that a baby was about to be baptised in the parish church near their encampment. They blocked the road and some of them were told, got into the church, pissed in the font, went to a gentleman's stable in the town, took out a horse and brought it into the church and there baptised it. It's not clear from the account whether this was a gratuitous desecration or whether they're trying to demonstrate that infant baptism was a grotesque parody of God's true ordinance. And I don't think it matters. The assault on long-standing Christian practice was equally severe either way. But denouncing infant baptism is the easy part. If you're reforming baptism, how can you be sure that the new practice that you've found is correct? Some of those who sought out the new adult baptism found it emotionally intense and satisfying. Others found that it left them cold or that their newfound zeal quickly faded or they noticed that baptism didn't actually appear to transform people's moral character. Some such people concluded that adult baptism too did not, as one said, answer the cry of our hearts. And they withdrew from these communities. Instead, as one such man put it, I gave myself up to a seeking state again. These seekers will be familiar enough by now. Like Frank and Schwenkfeld, like the Dutch collegians, like Bartholomew Leggett, they rejected all sacraments, all ministry, all church, but not because these things are demonstrably wrong, but because they hadn't yet found rights in ministry that were demonstrably right. They were waiting for proof, waiting for miracles to give witness to a new dispensation, miracles that would be unmistakable, not just rumours. And if God hadn't yet seen fit to provide such a thing, who were they to run on ahead of it? And it's not just about churches either. A clothier from Worcester named Clement Reiter, who's one of the first seekers to defend his views in print, had to confront orthodox critics who bombarded him with awkward biblical verses. And it turned out that he had the same scruples about the Bible as he had about churches. If a preacher tells him to obey the scriptures, he said, I must ask, what scriptures? The originals? Well, we don't have the originals. All we have are the copies of the copies. A translation of them? Well, which one? There are lots of different ones. They don't agree with each other. Texts whose interpretation is mysterious and dark? He concluded there is no rock to be built on here. The Bible cannot infallibly teach us anything at all. His fear of being deceived by error has meant that as a pious duty, he is refusing to embrace any truth. The Kentish seeker, Mary Springett, who unfortunately looks like she's been imprisoned in a meringue, uh, shows us what, what this religion of anxiety meant in practice. During the 1640s, she wrote, I changed my ways often. I ran from one notion to another, not finding satisfaction or assurance that I should obtain what my soul desired. I gave over all manner of exercises of religion in my family and in private. It now seemed to her to be just hypocrisy. She was ashamed, she said, to be accounted religious. And she grew to loathe anybody who claimed to be. And so at last, I began to conclude that the Lord and his truth was, but was made known to none upon the earth. There was nothing manifest since the apostles' days that was true religion. I knew nothing to be so certainly of God as I could shed my blood in defense of it. It was braver, indeed it was more truly pious to admit her utter ignorance of God than to worship some imaginary substitute. And so she said, I resolved in my heart that I would be without a religion until the Lord had manifestly taught me one. She'd become a devout and expectant unbeliever. 
The seekers' hopes are real. They genuinely seem to have believed that the time would come when God would send a new dispensation. The difficulty with this hope is not just that it becomes thinner the longer it's delayed, but that it doesn't solve the problem of what you do in the meantime. If the seekers met together, and it does seem that at least some of them did, like the collegians, they did so more as discussion groups than as congregations. Even on their own, they abandoned most of their, most or all of their former religious practices, either doubting that they could ever do them right or trusting that they'd ascended above fleshly habits like prayer or reading your Bible. As an act of faith, they've renounced religion. So what should they do? How should they live? This is the crucial question. And the answer to it is momentous. They transpose their religion into a moral key. One woman, told by a radical preacher that nothing of what she believed was certain, asked what in that case she should do. And the preacher replied, if you live honestly and modestly, you shall do well enough. Some suggested that instead of meeting for worship, seekers should gather to read some good moral things like the works of Plutarch or Cicero. As Clement Writer put it, if all doctrine and authority was uncertain, the only certainty left is God's law written in every human heart. That's the only yardstick against which churches, their doctrines and their gods might be measured. The only way to truly follow God is to abandon dogma. The price of doing that is to redefine following God as striving to adhere to a supposedly universal moral law, which may be magnificent, but it's not religion. It's also impossible. Apart from anything else, while most 17th century people believed that a universal natural law existed, they couldn't quite agree on its contents. Just what counts as immoral? Respectable England was swept in 1649-50 by a panic about a group called the Ranters, who it was said abandoned any kind of sexual restraint they claimed that God had given them liberty to do as they pleased and that marriage was just another human superstition. A lot of this is prurient, scurrilous nonsense. But this much is true. If you climb above all devotional practice, all communal religious life, all doctrinal fixed points, even all moral conventions, then no matter how sincere your principles are, you are kind of exposed to maintain that sort of rarefied trans-religious spirituality and to live your life in the unblinking, invisible light of reason is not easy. It's no surprise if those who set out up this mountain found that they struggled actually to make homes for themselves once they're up above the tree line. One of the most compelling accounts of seeker life um, comes from the charismatic former preacher Lawrence Claxton. He tells how his itinerant life began to offer him worldly compensations. He found that he could make a decent living preaching radical doctrines and handing round a collection hat. He also found that his freewheeling doctrines of spiritual liberty segued very nicely into arguments against conventional sexual morals. And eventually, he tells us, the main point of his ministry became preying on his audience's pockets and on their chastity. He told his followers in London that till you can lie with all women as with one woman and not judge it sin, you can do nothing but sin. You have to demonstrate that you've, uh, you've, you've outgrown these conventional moral norms. Um, and by this time he admitted he was acting entirely cynically, preaching whatever lies served his own end best and uh, his own ends best and no longer believing any of it. Now this account is itself highly untrustworthy. But the arc from idealism through opportunism to cynicism is, I think, plausible enough. After all, once you've abandoned all the constraints and structures of your old religion, who's going to stop you? For a more highbrow but equally notorious example of the way that conventional morality could dissolve along with religious certainty, consider the philosopher Thomas Hobbes who became so notorious in his own lifetime for unbelief 
that it was said, he cannot walk the streets, but the boys point at him saying, there goes Hobbes the atheist. Probably wasn't exactly true. Um, he conformed outwardly to the Church of England for most of his life. Um, he may even have attended its worship, traditional worship in the 1650s when it was illegal to do it. But his reported claim that he liked the religion of the Church of England best of all other makes it sound more like an aesthetic choice than a confession of faith. Um, and it's distinctly muted in its enthusiasm. Um, whatever else, if he accepted the church, he certainly didn't like its priests. Um, when clergy pestered him on his sickbed, he threw them out with threats to expose the deceits of their entire caste from ancient times to now. Um, and the fourth and final section of his great book, Leviathan, um, the, the bit that nobody reads, uh, th that's titled The Kingdom of Darkness, is essentially an extended howl of rage against the clergy. It's that book which principally gave him his reputation for atheism, especially the second half, which is supposedly devoted to religion. Um, he became particularly notorious for his attack on the authority of the Bible. But this isn't what, it's not about disinterested biblical scholarship. For all his convention, outwardly conventional religion, Hobbes's two-pronged attack, both on the Bible and on the clergy, has something seekerish about it. His persistent theme throughout the religious passages of Leviathan is that certain religious knowledge is impossible. No human claim about God, he said, whether it's made by priests or made by the Bible, is or ever can be proved beyond question. Even if it were to be authorised by miracles, as so many seekers had said, that wouldn't prove it beyond question. Churchmen, individual believers, may be free to believe such claims for themselves, but they can't compel anybody else. All they can do is, as the first apostles did, to persuade. That sense of provisionality is used by seekers to argue that no religion is possible. Hobbes gives the same argument a simple twist. He'd spent the first half of his book arguing for the absolute sovereignty of secular governments. He now claimed that since absolute religious truth is unknowable, secular government's control ought to extend to religion too. He doesn't argue, it, the times when it almost looks like he does, but he's, he's not saying that secular governments have some secret religious knowledge. Simply that they are no more likely to be wrong about religion than anybody else, and that nobody can prove that they're wrong. And therefore, since we submit to them in everything else, we should submit to them in religion too. He's particularly hostile to any notion of separate religious authority. All real religious authority should be vested in secular governments, he says. Not because of some divine right of kings, but because the mere fact of being in power bestows on itself religious as well as political authority. All other truths are provisional. Political power is all that's left. I think what's truly shocking about Hobbes's view is not that he believes that religious truth is fundamentally inaccessible. I, the seekers share that view with him. It's the fact that that problem doesn't seem to trouble him. He does seem to have believed that there is a God. I, I think we have to dismiss an implausible amount of his writing as smoke screens otherwise he's simply not very interested in the question, except insofar as he's suspicious of anybody claiming to act in God's name. The deity whom he really reveres is political power. And I think the reputation that he won for atheism from this is not unjust. Still, I don't want to give the impression that the acid bath that the spiritualists had plunged religion into usually or inevitably led to abandonment of moral frameworks in this way. Quite the opposite. The norm for these people was intense moral seriousness. The, the ranters are a, a largely, though not entirely, imaginary scare, blown entirely out of proportion. Hobbes is an isolated eccentric. The most common route that seekers eventually took, if we follow the, the individuals through, is that they became Quakers. The Quakers, of course, being a sect which successfully institutionalised 
most of the seekers' qualms about churches and rights and hierarchy and were marked by their intense and earnest moralism, guided as they saw it not by the dead word of the Bible but by the inner light of Christ. But I want to finish with a, a different, slightly less expected representative of this moralistic tradition in spiritualism, with the philosopher who did more than anyone else to create modern secular thought, the fountainhead of the Enlightenment, the most brilliant, the most notorious thinker of his age, Baruch Spinoza. Spinoza's story might at first seem to be quite different from the ones that I've been telling. He was a Dutch Jew who, in 1655, when he was 22, began to challenge his own community's orthodoxies. The following year, he was expelled from the synagogue in Amsterdam, and those early clashes eventually bore fruit in his theological political treatise, published in 1670. This is a devastating attack on the authority of the Bible, on any notion of the supernatural, on any attempts to override human reason, and in particular, on the authority of the clergy, on any idea of theocracy. It, that's a preoccupation that he shares with Hobbes, although they don't agree about much, much else. Spinoza's claim that nature is self-moving and creates itself is not exactly atheistic. I mean, it's closer to pantheism, but his reputation as the founding father of modern unbelief is, I think, well-deserved. But notice what happened after he was excommunicated from the synagogue in 1656. He fell in with the most intellectually open religious community in Amsterdam, Adam Bereel's collegians. And he did that at a moment of particular religious flux. A pair of English Quaker missionaries had just arrived in Amsterdam, and the collegians and the Quakers recognized one another as kindred spirits. And the young Spinoza quickly became a part of this milieu. He collaborated with a Quaker missionary. He translated a Quaker pamphlet into Hebrew. It was his first ever publication, you know, written in the vain hope of, of winning Jewish converts. The Quaker missionary with which he worked later wrote a detailed critique of the Bible, which anticipated, closely anticipated, many of Spinoza's arguments. We don't know for sure who learned what from who, but there's no doubt that the two men are intellectually very close. Another Quaker missionary in 1658 wrote that Spinoza was very friendly to their cause. Now, the, his friendship with the Quakers comes to an end because the Quakers and the Collegians fell out with each other. You know, in the way of sects, they were so similar to each other that their remaining differences were intolerable. Um, and Spinoza stuck with his Collegiate friends. One of them would translate Spinoza's first original book into Dutch. He remained personally close to a number of, of collegians for the rest of his life. And when he moved out of Amsterdam in 1660-61, he chose as his rural refuge the village of Rheinsburg, the heartland of the collegiate movement, which had been founded there four decades earlier. Spinoza, let's be clear, was never a Christian, but he was a collegiate fellow traveler, an affinity which would never have required him to contemplate anything so grossly carnal as a baptism. His early critique of both Christianity and Judaism is very much of a piece with the seeker and collegiate and Quaker critique of religion. The, the philosophical heft that he brought to the table was new, but the moral force behind it wasn't. A vital part of this is that despite his Jewish background, maybe because of his Jewish background, Spinoza had an extraordinarily popular view of Jesus, whom he calls not so much the prophet as the mouthpiece of God. He doesn't just unproblematically use the title Christ for him. That's not a small step for a Jew to take. He also repeatedly emphasized that Jesus' teaching and moral vision are so far above any other person's that, as he says, the voice of Christ may be called the voice of God. For all the withering skepticism he pours on most of the Bible, he is happy to accept the Christian gospels as being more or less accurate accounts, with the substantial exception that he blanket rejects any accounts of miracles in them. 
But here again, his reasoning is driven more by theology, by ethics, than by any sort of quasi-scientific skepticism. The reason that he believed that nature can't be contravened is because the alternative is to assert that God has created nature so weak that he is repeatedly compelled to come afresh to her aid. So the real problem with the notion of a miracle is that it's theologically incoherent. In fact, he says, because a miracle would be in contravention to God's nature and laws, consequently, belief in it would throw doubt upon everything and lead to atheism. Any collegiate or seeker might have said the same. And so the most truly devastating critique of religion in the Western tradition wasn't coming from outside, but from within. This is friendly fire. This is a determination to save religion from itself, driven as much by a compelling moral vision and critique as it was by any metaphysical concerns. Religion was going to be distilled over and over until nothing remained but pure spirit. And if that pure spirit produced madness or blindness, or even if it just boiled away into thin air, leaving an empty vessel behind, well, maybe that is the price of fearlessly pursuing God's truth. Thank you. Thank you.